Hi, my name is Jack Rackham, and today I'm going to show you the family tree of the Marathas, a group of Hindu dynasties that dominated India during the 18th century. We'll be looking at their emperors, who were known as Chhatrapatis, their hereditary prime ministers, known as Peshwas, as well as the Maharajas of some of the larger Maratha states. We'll even be tracing the lines all the way to the present. I'll be using this Maratha royal family tree chart, which Matt has recently created and which is available for download for free as a PDF. You can find a link to the file in the description. We tend to think of India as a single unified country because, well, that's what it is today. But throughout most of world history, India was actually divided into a bunch of smaller, often independent states. So really, one should think of India as more of a continent than a country. Sure, it's connected to Asia, but then again, so is Europe. Like Europe, India is comprised of many different types of people, often with their own unique languages and culture. In ancient times, it was really only united twice, first by the Maurya Empire, and then by the Gupta Empire. But as you can see, even in those cases, the unification was not complete. During the medieval period, the only state that came close to unifying India was the Delhi Sultanate. But then, in the 16th century, came the Mughal Empire, an Islamic empire with rulers of Mongol and Timurid descent. The Mughals managed to conquer more of India than anyone since the Mauryans. They are the ones who built the famous Taj Mahal. Which brings us to the Marathas. As I mentioned, the Mughals were a Muslim dynasty. However, in many parts of India, the majority of people were Hindu. Initially, the Mughals were tolerant of religious diversity, but when this started to break down, a group of warrior clans from the Deccan Plateau, known as the Marathas, started to fight for their independence. So with that background, let's now return to the family tree. The person who emerged as the leader of the Maratha clans was a man named Shivaji. He was eventually given the title Chhatrapati, which literally means umbrella ruler, and is thus similar to the title of emperor. He was the grandson of a man named Maloji Bosle, who was a Sardar, a title meaning commander, in the army of Malik Ambar. Never heard of Malik Ambar? Well, funny enough, I just made a video about him over on the Jack Rackham channel. I'll leave a link to that in the description. Once the Bosle dynasty was well established, they claimed that they were the descendants of an earlier Rajput dynasty called the Sisodians. The Sisodians, in turn, claimed to be the descendants of an ancient dynasty known as the Solar Dynasty, a dynasty that includes well-known figures such as Rama and the Buddha. Matt will be doing a video on the Solar and Lunar dynasties of India later this year. But in reality, it's likely that the Bosleys simply created these links to past dynasties in order to bolster their legitimacy. Something that we've seen numerous dynasties from all over the world do. It's kind of a pattern. Interestingly, though Hindu nationalists have often rallied around Maratha pride, the beginnings of the empire actually feature quite a bit of religious pluralism. Here's Odd Compass, a new channel dedicated to Indian history, to explain. The Marathas hailed from the Deccan region in south-central India a region well-known for its religious and ethno-linguistic pluralism. For example, even though the Maratha Sardar, Malaji Bosle, was a Hindu, he prayed at the shrine of the Sufi Muslim saint Shah Sharif. He prayed in the hopes that his wife would give birth to sons, and lo and behold, she did. As Malaji believed that his prayers had been answered, he named his sons Shahaji and Sharifji in honor of the Sufi saint. Shahaji, his name suffused with Sufi spirituality, would go on to father the legendary Shivaji. If you'd like to learn more about Indian history, check out my channel Odd Compass. I do encourage you to visit Odd Compass. I'll leave a link to the channel in the description. So Shivaji is credited as being the founder of the Maratha Empire, although the area controlled by the Marathas wouldn't really reach empire size until later. Today, he's revered by Hindu nationalists as one of their favorite heroes, and in fact, a statue of him is currently being built off the coast of Mumbai, which is set to become the largest statue in the world. Shivaji was succeeded by his son Sambhaji, but Sambhaji was eventually captured and killed by the Mughals. They also captured his son Shahu and held him prisoner. 
Therefore, another one of Shivaji's sons, by a different wife, became the next Chhatrapati. His name was Rajaram, and among his wives was his cousin Tarabai. She was the daughter of Hambir Rao Mohite, who had been Shivaji's top general as well as brother to his wife Soyarabai, Rajaram's mother. When Rajaram died suddenly due to an illness, she took over as regent on behalf of her son, Shivaji II. Tarabai was a skilled warrior and personally led the Maratha troops in their continued fight against the Mughals. At this point, the Mughals came up with what they thought was a cunning plan. They released Shahu from captivity and had him challenge Tarabai for the Maratha leadership, expecting him to end up becoming their puppet. Now, Shahu did in fact win the power struggle and become Chhatrapati. However, he did not become a Mughal puppet. Instead, he and the succeeding Chhatrapatis basically became puppets in the hands of the Peshwas. The Peshwas were kind of like prime ministers, and starting with a Peshwa named Balaji Vishwanath, the position became hereditary, staying within the Bhat family. We'll come back to the Peshwa family tree, but for now, let's continue with the Chhatrapatis. After Tarabai was defeated by Shahu, she initially ended up creating a rival court in the city of Kolhapur. Thus, her son, the former Chhatrapati Shivaji II, became the first Raja of Kolhapur. But shortly thereafter, another one of Rajaram's wives put her son, Sambhaji II, on that throne instead, thus creating the Kolhapur branch of the Bosle dynasty. And Tarabai ended up reconciling with Shahu. In fact, when Shahu died, she managed to get an individual that she claimed was her grandson to be named his successor. That person was Rajaram II, but there is some doubt as to whether or not he was actually the son of Shivaji II. Which brings me to the topic of adoption. In Hindu dynasties, a ruler would often adopt a male child as their heir, in cases where they did not have a son of their own. Another example of this occurred when Sambhaji II of Kolhapur died. There, he was replaced with Shivaji III in a posthumous adoption arranged by the various mothers in the court. But in these cases, the adopted child was not just anybody. They were always a male member of the same dynasty, just from a junior branch. In this case, Shivaji III was a descendant of Shivaji I's uncle, Sharifiji. Now at this point, the Maratha Empire was truly an empire. They had conquered most of the Mughal territory, and the Mughal Emperor had basically become their puppet. But remember, the real power during this period was held by the Peshwas, not by the Chhatrapatis. On this map, you can see Satara, which is where the Chhatrapatis had their court, as well as Kolhapur, which is where the Raja from that branch of the family was located. But you can also see Pune. This is where the Peshwas ruled from, and was thus the true capital of the Maratha Empire. So, at this point, let's look at the Peshwa family tree. As I mentioned earlier, it starts with Balaji Vishwanath, but it was during the rule of his son, Baji Rao I, that most of the Maratha conquests took place. Baji Rao was an incredible military tactician, and it is often pointed out that in his 20 years of leadership, he never lost a single battle. He was succeeded by his son, Balaji Rao. He continued the expansion of the empire, but during his tenure, much of the actual conquering was done by various other generals who served under him. This is because the empire had grown very large, and therefore the leaders of various other Maratha clans had been given lands to rule. So it's at this point that several other important Maratha dynasties got their start, such as the Gaekwads and the Shindes. They became rulers of the Baroda and Gwalior states respectively, two states that rose to prominence later on once the British took over. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. At the very end of Balaji Rao's rule, one of the most important battles in Indian history took place, the Third Battle of Panipat, which took place just north of Delhi and pitted the Marathas against the Afghan Durrani Empire. It was one of the largest battles anywhere in the world during the early modern period, and resulted in one of the highest number of casualties ever reported in a single day until World Wars I and II. 
and the Third Battle of Panipat was the Maratha's first major loss. The dead included the Peshwa's eldest son and heir, Vishawas Rao, commander of the Maratha forces, Sadashiv Rao, Baji Rao's son, Shamshur Bahadur, who had become ruler of Banda, as well as the leaders of both Baroda and Gwalior. Balaji Rao himself died a few months after this devastating battle, but the Marathas rebounded under Malaji Rao's second son, Madhav Rao, and the leaders of the various Maratha states. By this point, the Maratha Empire was actually more of a confederacy of states, which is why it is sometimes referred to as the Maratha Confederacy at this stage. During the confederacy stage, the Peshwas, who had already replaced a pretty much useless hereditary dynasty, ended up becoming a pretty much useless hereditary dynasty themselves. Madhav Rao was followed by his brother Narayan Rao, who was then assassinated by his uncle, Ragunat Rao. But Narayan Rao's wife was pregnant at the time, and when she gave birth to a son, that son, named Madhav Rao, was named the new Peshwa. So you ended up with regents who were ruling on behalf of a ceremonial ruler, who was in turn ruling on behalf of another ceremonial ruler, Chhatrapati Rajaram II. So under the young Peshwa Madhav Rao, the individual Maratha states became more and more independent and India started to fragment again. This was made worse by the fact that the various European powers were becoming more and more involved on the subcontinent, particularly the British. During the tenure of Madhav Rao, the first Anglo-Maratha war occurred, with the Marathas coming out victorious. But there was a second and a third Anglo-Maratha war, which occurred during the tenure of the next, and final, Peshwa, Raghunath Rao's son, Baji Rao II. The British won both of these wars, and in 1818, the Maratha Empire ceased to exist. At that point, the Chhatrapati was Pratap Singh, legally the great-grandson of Shahu I. He was stripped of his emperor rank title and was given the title Raja of Satara instead. But in 1839, even this was stripped away, and soon thereafter, the British considered the line to be dead. However, within the Bosle family itself, the now ceremonial title of Chhatrapati was considered to be handed over to the Kolhapur branch, with Shivaji V being the first member of that branch to hold the distinction. They continued to pass it along to their descendants, some of whom were adopted from other Maratha clans, all the way until India's independence in the late 1940s. At that point, all Indian noble titles ceased to exist. However, they are still passed on for ceremonial and traditional purposes, and today, the heir to both the Kolhapur monarchy and the title of Chhatrapati is this person here, who, if reigning today, would be Shahu II. The Satara branch has also maintained their line officially, and today, the current head of that branch is a BJP politician named Udayan Rajay Bosle. But before we go, let's go back and talk about some of the other Maratha states. This chart shows only two of them, those of Baroda and Gwalior, but keep in mind that there were also many others. Earlier I mentioned that the Maratha Empire ceased to exist in 1818. For the next 40 years, most of the Maratha territories were under the control of the British East India Company. But then, in 1857, there was a major revolt against British rule. One of the leaders of that revolt was the adopted son of the last Peshwa, Nana Saheb. But the revolt was not successful, and resulted in the British crown taking direct control over India, and much of the area surrounding India as well. This period in history is known as the British Raj. The British Raj was, like previous Indian empires, not a single state, but rather a collection of states. Some of these were known as princely states and were given a certain degree of autonomy. Of the 565 princely states recognized by the British, they considered five of them to be the most important and gave them the designation of being a 21-gun salute state. The two Maratha states of Baroda and Gwalior were given that distinction, so let's take a quick look at their family trees. For most of the British Raj period, the Maharaja of Baroda was Sayaji Rao. He had a very long reign of 64 years. He was followed by his grandson, Pratap Singh Rao, who became the last official Maharaja of Baroda. Today, one of Pratap Singh Rao's own grandsons is the ceremonial Maharaja. 
His name is Samarjit Singh, and he is a former professional cricketer. The Maharaja of Gwalior during the early part of the British Raj was Jayaji Rao. He was followed by his son Madhavaro and grandson Jiwaji Rao. Jiwaji Rao married Vijaya Raje, who became one of the original founders of the BJP. Their son Madhav Rao became a member of the opposing party, the National Congress, and served as a minister in the cabinet of Prime Minister Narasimha Rao. He died in a plane crash in 2001, and therefore the current ceremonial Maharaja of Gwalior is his son Jyotiraditya. Jyotiraditya had also served as a minister in the National Congress government, but recently switched sides and is now a member of the BJP. Interestingly, he married a granddaughter of the last Maharaja of Baroda, thus creating a connection between these two dynasties. I should also point out that both of the couple's mothers are descendants from Nepalese noble families. So in India, just like in Europe, you often see members of defunct royal houses still marrying members of other defunct royal houses. Certainly helps sell newspapers, if nothing else. As I mentioned at the beginning of the video, this complete chart is available for free as a PDF download. Because of COVID, Useful Charts is unable to ship posters to India at the moment, and since there were a lot of requests for electronic versions after we covered the Mughal Emperors, Matt thought he'd make this chart available for free, especially for the Useful Charts subscribers in India. So you can find a link to the download in the description, as well as a link to the video about the Mughal Emperors. And be sure to keep an eye out for the upcoming video on the Solar and Lunar Dynasties. You can expect that sometime this fall. Thanks for watching.